we have a very exciting speaker today. Um, we have Dr. Anka Hules, who is a, an assistant professor of epidemiology in the Rollins School of Public Health. She's jointly appointed to the Department of Environmental Health and Biostatics, Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Her talk today is going to inform us a little bit better about the exposome. We've been using those words in Alzheimer's research, and the exposome is what's in the environment and how it affects us. And what she's going to talk about in the environment today is pollution and how pollution is a risk, is a contributor, if you will, to the onset and development of Alzheimer's. So she does other research, but this is the reason she's here with us today. So Dr. Hules, please inform us. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, do you see this okay? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Great. Yeah, so as Dr. Parker already said, uh, my talk today will focus on the effects of air pollution on dementia. Um, and, and specifically, I will show you some data that is based on early biomarkers of disease and omics profiling of brain samples. In general, um, we all know that our health is strongly influenced by the air we breathe. Um, fine particle air pollution comes from many different sources, including vehicle emissions, coal burning, power plants, in industrial emissions, and many other human and also natural sources. The size of particles is directly linked to their potential for causing health problems. So traditionally, we divide particles into two main groups, and these two groups are different in many ways. So PM10, as you can see here, is particles between 2.5 and 10 micrometers in diameter. So in comparison, a human hair is about 60 micrometers in diameter. And PM2.5 is particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers. So um, you can see that these particles are really, really small when you compare them to a human hair or even to fine beach sand. And due to their really small size, um, they are particularly dangerous because that also means that they can get really deep into our body and um, cause severe health effects. So for example, PM2.5 particles are so small that when you breathe them in and they get into your respiratory system, they can, from your lungs, they can get into the, the alveoli and from there they can enter your bloodstream. And once they've entered your bloodstream, they can cause um, systemic inflammation in the body, which also has been linked to neuroinflammation, for example. And these particles are also so small that they can actually pass, um, they can, that they can actually enter your brain. So if you inhale um, particles of, of the size of smaller than 2.5 micrometers um, and you inhale them, they can basically... Um, enter your olfactory nerve and from there they can enter your brain and many of um, the PM 2.5 components are neurotoxic so once they've entered your brain they can cause um, severe damage on the brain and therefore have been linked to things like Alzheimer's disease dementia and also depression and in general air pollution is the fifth leading risk factor for mortality worldwide and it is responsible for more deaths than better known risk factors, such as malnutrition, alcohol use, and physical inactivity. And each year, more people die from air pollution-related diseases than from road traffic injuries or malaria. Overall, more than 90% of people worldwide live in areas exceeding the WHO guidelines for healthy air. And more than half live in areas that do not even meet the WHO's least stringent air quality target. And um, so the data that I will presenting you um, is from the US and specifically and specifically from the metro, metro Atlanta area. So um, when you see this map, you might be wondering, yeah, but the air pollution concentrations here in the US are actually pretty good, at least in comparison to other parts of the world. Um, but I, I hope that um, during my talk, I might be able to convince you that even 
even lower levels of air pollution, so lower than 10, 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5, can still be dangerous um, for our health and for our cognitive health in particular. So the question is, how does air pollution affect our brain? And um, I already um, mentioned um, that due to its small size, PM2.5 can actually um, enter our brain and um, has therefore been linked to, um, to um, depression and dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, how do we actually know that PM2.5 particles can enter our brain? Because of course that sounds pretty scary. So you might be wondering if that's actually true. And actually one of the very, very first studies that looked into the effects of air pollution on dementia was conducted um, in a study um, from Mexico City. And in that study, they actually, they, um, they conducted an autopsy of, um, of dogs living in the streets of Mexico City. And um, you all know that Mexico City is a highly polluted city. So um, they conducted an autopsy on, on dogs living in those streets and were able to find air pollution particles in the brains of the dogs. And that was really, that was about 20 years ago. And that was really one of, that was the very, very first study that showed that air pollution can be linked to dementia. And over the last two decades, more and more studies have shown uh, similar things, not only in, uh, in dogs, but also in humans. And um, also, so using different kinds of data um, from all over the world. And um, the findings that I will present you um, within the next few minutes will, are also adding to that, um, to the really strong evidence for an association between air pollution and dementia. So um, I would like to start um, introducing you to um, one of the studies um, here at Emory University, which is led by Dr. Jim La. And um, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the study. So it's the Emory Healthy Brain Study. And um, the goal of the Emory Healthy Brain Study is to further the scientific understanding of how we age and the diseases that occur more commonly in later years with a, with a strong focus on the central nervous system and dementia. And um, it's a cognitively healthy Atlanta prospective cohort nested within the larger Emory Healthy Aging Study, which is an online survey-based study, um, including, I think at the moment, about 30,000 or more participants. Um, the goal is to enroll around two two and a half thousand um, EH. EHAS participants into the Emory Healthy Brain Study, and um, they have at least um, a clinical visit every other year, um, which includes, among other, other procedures, also cognitive testing and assessment of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And so I'm highlighting these two because those are um, the measurements that I will focus on in my presentation. So here's some um, study characteristics of the study participants in the Emory Healthy Brain Study that we included in our analysis. So we included um, in total three and a half thousand observations from um, up to four visits. Um, so while most participants only um, had only had one visit, um, was were only included once in our analysis, some participants had more visits. Um, and up to four. So a few participants even had um, data from four visits. And um, so the mean age at enrollment was about 65 years. Um, we had more female than male participants. The majority was white, um, but we also um, had uh, about 17% um, Black or African American participants um, and a few others from um, other races. Um, almost half of the participants had a master's degree or higher. So it's a pretty well-educated um, study population. Okay, so one of the um, outcomes that we focused on um, is a memory, memory test, and it's the so-called delayed recall test. And let me briefly introduce you to this test in particular um, by showing you a short one-minute video um, introducing you to this. I hope this works. And let me know if you don't, don't hear the sound, but you should. The delayed three-word recall test is a useful memory test that might help diagnose mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. 
You should give the patient three words. You should get the patient to recall the words to you immediately to make sure that they've heard the words and then wait for three to five minutes before getting them to recall the words. So I'm going to give you three words to remember now. The words are apple, penny and table. Could you repeat those to me? Apple, penny, table. That's great. If you just remember those, I'll ask you them again in a few minutes. Okay. So a few minutes ago, I gave you three words to remember. Do you remember those words? Yes. Could you let me know what they are? Apple, penny, table. That's fantastic. Okay, so this is an example for one of the tests um, that was conducted as part of the MO Health and Brain Study. And so that test was conducted um, every two years. And um, so we um, analyzed those test results for that specific memory test here shown in the first column, but also other tests. So for example, um, these first two tests, the delayed recall test and the recognition test, um, those um, assess the memory um, uh, memory, potential memory impairment. Then we have the test, um, a test for the executive function and two tests for language. And um, so here you can see the association results for the association between PM 2.5 exposure and cognitive function in the MO Healthy Brain Study. And um, so this line means that there is no effect and um, a negative association means that higher levels of air pollution are associated with lower cognitive scores, which is the direction that we would expect to see, given that um, our hypothesis is that air pollution is associated with dementia risk. And uh, what we found is that we found a significant association between PM 2.5 exposure and um, the cognitive scores for memory here in the first two columns and also execute a function, but we did not find an association with the language scores. So, which means that different domains of cognitive function might seem to be um, affected differently by air pollution. And um, another thing that we noticed is, so you can see that here are always four effect estimates and conference intervals in each column and each refers to a different time period um, of air pollution exposure. So um, for example, here three year means that this is the average, um, the average PM 2.5 exposure that a particular participant was exposed to um, over, the, over the three, three years prior to the cognitive testing. And five years means over five years prior to testing and 10 years and 15 years. So um, increasing time windows of exposure. And um, so those are always the exposure concentrations at a participant's residential home address, so where they live. And uh, what we can see is that um, with higher, with longer exposure windows, we see a stronger association with cognitive function, which means that in particular, um, when when people are exposed to high levels of air pollution over a long period of time, so 10 years or 15 years, that really has the strongest effect on cognitive function. Um, but one question that um, we can't answer with just looking at cognitive tests is what exactly is happening in the brain when we are exposed to high levels of air pollution? So um, here is a summary um, of or, or an image showing what, what is actually happening in the brain when someone develops Alzheimer's disease. So two hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are amyloid plaques, as you can see here, which are aggregates of misfolded proteins that form in the spaces between nerve cells. And the other hallmark of Alzheimer's disease are the tangles that you can see here. And those are abnormal accumulations of a protein called tau that form bundles of twisted filaments inside neurons, as you can see here. And um, so when we are able to actually look at the brains, so like in an autopsy cohort, um, these can be assessed um, with different um, assessment tools. So um, for example, the Brax stage evaluates the tangles, um, and the Serrat score evaluates the um, beta amyloid plaques. 
And um, then there's also the ABC score, which is a combination of the two. And um, so we, in, in this project, we use data from autopsy samples collected by the Emory um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, which is, um, and Alan Levy is the director of that Alzheimer's Center. Um, so we included um, donors who lived in the Metro Atlanta area, um, who died after 2008 at the age of 55 or older. Um, and that um, led to a sample size of 224 donors. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we looked at different neuropathology markers, so Bragg stage, Serrat, and ABC scores that evaluate the severity of Alzheimer's disease. So um, as you can see here, um, the mean age of the participants when they died was 76 years. Um, most of them were white, um, less than 10% were black. Um, we had slightly more male than female um, and more, more people than in the general population were carriers of at least one APOE4 allele. And that, that's also um, correlated with the fact that um, most of the donors were diagnosed with either Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia before they died. So we only had um, less than 6% um, who basically were controlled, so without a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or dementia before they died. And that's also why in, in this study, we, we did not look at Alzheimer's disease, yes, no. So we actually looked at those neuropathology markers, which, um, which describe the severity of Alzheimer's disease. So that's um, the outcome that we are looking at here. And um, similar to the M. Healthy Brain study, we looked at... Um, at PM2.5 concentrations at the at the participants address. And of course, so here it's the um, air pollution concentration at the donor's last residential address before they died. And um, then these are our main findings. So we found that PM2.5 was associated with um, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, especially here with the CERAT score, um, which measures um, amyloid beta plaque density. Um, so here you can see that um, we found a significant association between PM2.5 exposure and higher CERAT scores, which means um, a more severe form of Alzheimer's disease. And um, interestingly, we found that the association was particularly strong among donors who did not carry at least one APOE4 allele, which is the strongest um, genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So that means that um, air pollution could actually explain some of the um, some of the AD risk among people who are not um, genetically predisposed um, to Alzheimer's disease. And so um, the findings from this paper, this project were published in Neurology earlier this year and were also picked up by the media, um, by, yeah, by, for example, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and also um, local newspapers in Atlanta. Um, and of course, why, so why, why this really wasn't the first study looking, showing an association between air pollution and dementia, Something that is particularly important about our study was that we were actually looking at um, changes in brain tissues. So we were one of the first studies who could show what was what is actually going on in the brain when people are exposed to high levels of air pollution. Um, but of course, a limitation of that study was that um, most of the participants, or really almost everyone, had some form of Alzheimer's disease, um, and they were also they were all dead, and so at at an older age, um, at an older age, and it's especially for prevention and intervention purposes, it is particularly interesting to also assess this kind of association and the risk in participants who have not developed Alzheimer's yet, but maybe show some first um, bio, some first signs of, of maybe developing Alzheimer's disease in the next years or decades. Um, 
So um, in our in the next study, which is focused again on uh, participants from the Emory Healthy Brain Study, which en enrolls um, cognitively healthy participants at enrollment, um, we focus specifically on CSF biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So um, basically, um, here you can see how these biomarkers are collected. So they are measured in cerebrospinal fluid and um, using this procedure. And um, so basically, um, we are looking at um, biomarkers for um, reflecting the amyloid plug burden in the brain and also um, um, the tau tangles. And um, so th this analysis is focused on a subset of the Emory Healthy Brain Study. Um, so this analysis was conducted um, one to two years ago, um, including uh, more than a thousand um, EHBS participants um, with um, biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease available. And uh, what we found was that PM2.5 was associated with a beta 42, which is one of the CSF biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, um, in EHBS participants without a diagnosis of dementia. And again, um, the A beta 42 biomarker reflects the amyloid plug burden in the brain. So we found exactly the same thing that we also saw in the autopsy cohort, which is quite interesting because those two populations are very, very different from each other. The brain, the autopsy cohort, they were all, they were on average 15 years older. They almost everyone had some form of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, whereas the EHBS participants were all cognitively healthy and on average 15 years younger. Um, so it is very interesting that we are seeing exactly the same association, um, which again strengthens um, um, the evidence for really um, our observation that um, PM2.5 affects particularly the, the development of amyloid plaques in the brain. Um, and we, we, in contrast, we did not find an association with biomarkers that reflect um, the tau tangles in the brain. And um, so next, um, we um, again use the same brain samples from the autopsy cohort. And um, the question that we wanted to answer next is whether omics technologies can help us to understand the biological mechanisms underlying the association between PM2.5 exposure and Alzheimer's disease. So we conducted epigenetic and metabolomic profiling of 162 prefrontal cortex samples um, from the Emory ADSC brain bank. So here you can see where the prefrontal cortex is located in the brain. And um, so epigenomics um, was conducted using the EPIC array, which measures 850,000 CPG sites, and metabolomics um, was conducted using liquid um, chromat chromatography uh, with high resolution mass spectrometry techniques. And um, first of all, um, we here are the results for the epigenetic analysis. And um, so investigating whether DNA methylation um, can explain some, explain biological mechanisms connecting PM2.5 and Alzheimer's disease pathology. And what we found, um, so we found that in total 22 CPG sites were identified as potential mediators. And interestingly, many of, of the associated genes have already been reported in other studies um, to be important um, for either Alzheimer's disease or um, or biological mechanism, mechanisms affected by PM2.5. So for example, um, uh, we found um, genes that have been reported um, to be associated with neuroprotection, neuroinflammation, um, and also um, ne inhibitory neurotransmitter and CNS, and also longevity pathways. And um, in our untargeted metabolomics profiling of the same brain samples, um, we also found um, similar pathways to um, be associated with PM2.5 exposure and also with Alzheimer's disease. And among those, um, 
the ones that were particularly interesting were neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and energy production-related pathways, which were associated with both PM2.5 levels and Alzheimer's disease neuropathology. So again, that gives us a better idea of which biological pathways might be affected by air pollution high air pollution concentrations. And um, this can also help us um, when we think about um, what might be potential prevention strategies. So to sum up, um, in our study based on the Ammo Healthy Brain study, we found that long-term exposure to PM2.5, so in particular 10 years or longer, is associated with worse cognitive test results, especially for memory and executive function. Um, we also found um, in our findings from CSF biomarkers and postmortem a Alzheimer's disease pathology that um, amyloid plaques development is particularly, particularly affected by PM2.5 exposure. And um, the omics profiling of, um, of the same brain samples showed us that differential DNA methylation at several CPG sites related to neuroinflammation and neuroinflammation-mediated cell death mediated the adverse effects of PM2.5 exposure on the levels of Alzheimer's disease-related neuropathology markers and metabolites related to neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and energy production-related pathways were associated with PM2.5 exposure and Alzheimer's disease neuropathology. So with that, I would like to thank my research group at Emory University and also my, all my colleagues at Emory, and of course, also the different funding sources that support this research. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hules. If you wouldn't mind going back to that map of Atlanta where you showed like where um, that one, that, yeah. that one right here. So if we look at this map that you have, people living in the uh, northeast or northwest parts of metropolitan Atlanta have better air than those of us who live, I'll say, south of I-20. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. So if we don't live north of I-20 and we live toward the south, what kinds of things might we do to make to improve the air that we breathe? Yeah. And make so it less likely. And and I guess you didn't really go into it. I guess I really didn't hear it. But based on the samples of the people who are in the Emory Healthy Brain Study, were you finding a higher incidence of dementia in people who resided in these areas that are brown like this? Yes. So um, in one of our previous studies, we we could show that particularly um, participants living in the, yeah, basically in, yes, south of, um, of downtown Atlanta, um, those participants were at the highest risk of um, of developing Alzheimer's disease um, or, or show the highest association with, um, with air pollution. And um, the reason is also that um, we, ought, we often also see um, joint effects of air pollution and other adverse risk factors. So for example, um, of course, air pollution is not the only um, factor that can negatively influence our cognitive health. So for example, li living in an adverse neighborhood, for example, with high poverty rates, high crime rates, et cetera, can also um, basically lead to synergistic effects with air pollution on our cognitive health. And so going back to your questions about um, what we can actually do to um, protect us from those adverse effects. Um, so basically um, to protect to protect us from high levels of air pollution, um, I would recommend that you carefully watch out um, for, um, for days with particularly high levels of air pollution. So over the last few weeks, for example, we observed pretty high levels of air pollution in the metro Atlanta area due to the current heat wave in combination to traffic related air pollution. And on those days, um, I would recommend that you don't spend too much time outside and if you have to, um, at least try to avoid physical activity outside, because um, that is particularly dangerous when the air pollution concentrations are high. 
And on days with really, really high air pollution concentrations, it could also be a good idea to, to, um, to wear one of the N95 masks that you might still have from the pandemic, because those also can help you to protect you against the effects of air pollution so that the particles can't enter your body. And um, in addition to that, um, we all know, and, and of course, um, we all uh, participated in the physical activity um, at the beginning of, um, of, of this um, of this session. So um, things that are known to protect us from or lower our risk to develop Alzheimer's disease, like physical activity, a good diet, these kind of things, they help us to that they also protect us against the um, the adverse effects of air pollution. So um, doing all the right things um, definitely lowers your risk for Alzheimer's, risk of Alzheimer's disease. Also, when you are exposed to high levels of air pollution. So on that note, there is somebody who's trying to understand, and it makes sense. Uh, PM two point five. What does that mean? What is PM two? I want you to keep that mask up, but somebody's trying to understand what PM two point five means. Yes. So um, that basically describes the size of the particle. So it, is an, um, it describes basically a combination of different air pollutants. So PM2.5 is, a, for example, is um, a combination of different components. So for example, um, organic carbon, black carbon, elemental carbon, um, and other components form PM2.5 because it's simply described by its size. Um, so it's a comp combination of different um, different um, chemicals and metals that can be found in the air, and PM two point five is described by its size. So it's two point that particle that is a combination of different chemicals is smaller than two point five micrometers in diameter um, per cubic meter. So um, and because this is really really small. Um, you need, for example, if you go outside and you want to protect yourself with by wearing a mask, um, an N95 mask, for example, is good enough to protect you from particles that side coming in. Okay, another question, um, and this is about the exposome, the environment, environmental risk factors for dementia, and you've well defined or um, explained pollution, but one of the callers wants to understand what is the connection between air pollution and social economics? Yes, unfortunately, I don't have that slide up now. But um, so um, the thing is, so we conducted a study and, and based on the Emory Healthy Aging study. So um, the outcome that we looked at was subjective cognitive decline um, based on the online survey. And what we found is that when, for example, you live in a neighborhood um, in a very positive neighborhood with a low crime rate, um, a high average socioeconomic status, um, good health care, and so on, you really don't see an effect, an adverse effect of air pollution on cognitive function because these positive neighborhood factors can really protect you from the adverse effects of air pollution on the brain. In contrast, when you live in a neighborhood with a really high crime rate, a low socioeconomic status on average, um, and many adverse neighborhood factors, that really um, leads to synergistic effects of air pollution and um, adverse neighborhood factors on cognitive health. So what we found is that we found the strongest risk for Alzheimer's disease among people who are exposed to both. So living in an adverse neighborhood plus being exposed to really high levels of air pollution. Okay. On that note, if you live in these areas, are trees or the green space, is that protective and is that helpful in any way? Um, and then there's another question that talks about the different kinds of gases, radon gas, and in the southeast and southwest part of Metro Atlanta, you have the airport. Is this a risk factor for dementia? All oh, great questions. Um, so in terms of green space, um, trees and so on are always good because they help to clean the, the air, basically. Um, and there are several studies that are now coming coming out that also look at protective factors of green space, protecting you from the adverse effects of air pollution. 
Um, we have not yet incorporated that information in our study, so I can directly comment on it, but I know that other studies have looked to, looked into it and have seen that green space, trees, etc., can you can protect you from the adverse effects of air pollution. Um, then in terms of the airport, um, so of course, yeah, also the airport contributes to um to bad bad air quality. Um Probably not as much as traffic in the Metro Atlanta area, but of course, if you live very, very close to the airport, then your main source for air pollution might actually be um, basically the, the planes that start and land. And um, But those factors are all incorporated in our models because that's really, um, that doesn't, doesn't look at specific sources, but we rather look satellite data and so on, which really incorporates um, the air pollution concentrations um, at each location independent of the source. So that, that would be included here in, in these models. But yeah, air, air pollution from um, airports and planes definitely contributes to to this, yes. So on that note, if you live in Forest Park, College Park, East Point, you have a higher risk of having uh, plane pollution <laughs> contributing to your the air in your environment. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Is there any particular gas that's more likely to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's, like radon versus um, nitrous oxide? I don't know. The gases in the environment. Is there one gas that's worse for you than others? I don't remember seeing any evidence for radon being particularly um, relevant here, but um, so and. So there, there are certainly studies that have shown an association with um, nitrogen oxides in association with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we are currently um, conducting some follow-up studies where we also look at specific PM2.5 components and some of them, um, and to see which actual components of this PM2.5 mixture are particularly dangerous. So. Um, we will probably learn more about that over the next few years, also when our air pollution models are getting a little better estimating other things than just PM2.5 as a whole. Bad air in my office building. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, I have no problems wearing an air mask, uh, uh, an N95 mask in crowded areas. And consistent with what happened during the pandemic, we didn't have nearly as much flu or respiratory illness when people wore them. Although people find wearing a mask a political statement, wearing an N95 mask can, can help our lungs and, and, and diminish our risk of um, Alzheimer's or related dementia, as you've, as you've pointed out. So other than trees and mitigating, other mitigating factors like uh, walkable neighborhood safety and other things, these are environmental risk factors. Can you talk about some of the other environmental risk factors for that may contribute to put one at risk for Alzheimer's aside from pollution? You talked a little bit about crime. Mm -hmm. You did talk a little bit about um um I I said green space, but we talked about exercise. Can you kind of explain? And Envi other environmental risk factors that are in are consistent with poor health and not just Alzheimer's. What are other e environmental risk factors? Yeah, so something that is also really important and which is also oftentimes correlated with bad, bad air quality is noise. So noise is another factor that, um, of course, can be related to traffic, but also to living close to an airport but also other things in an urban environment that are pretty loud. And noise has also been linked to various health outcomes, including Alzheimer's disease. And there again, um, some studies again also have shown synergistic effects of several of these environmental factors. So when people are exposed to both, so a lot of noise, but also high levels of air pollution, they are at a particularly high risk. Okay. Um, a question here is, and this is important, living near a landfill, what does a landfill do and how does landfill 
contribute to pollution? Like a landfill site, like a dump? I call it a dump. <laughs> like um, a trash site that they fill with dirt. Yeah, so that of course could is probably particularly important for um yeah for, for pollution of um yeah drinking water for example. I think for, for that it is it should is probably particularly important for drinking water. Um and of course that's also one way how chemicals could get into our body by the food or by the water we drink. So it's it's a different pathway by which we could um be exposed to various pollutants that then again um could cause things like um Alzheimer's disease or other adverse health outcomes. Okay. And I'm I, there are two questions I'm trying to make them work on. I don't know that you can necessarily comment on any particular social policies um that have to do with air regulation. Is there something that we as citizens should be looking at or asking our representatives to support to make it less likely that we have much pollution? Yeah, that's a great question. So of course things, so as a, not just for an individual, but for for our whole community that help to reduce air pollution concentrations is of course having fewer cars on the roads and um, especially cars that, yeah, Cost a lot of gas. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> fossil fuels. Yes. Fossil so you're fuels. a supporter of electric vehicles for Ex reducing pollution. Exactly. So using vehicle um electric vehicles can um significantly help to improve our air pollution um concentrations in the Metro Atlanta area. So having affordable EVs, I think, is a, a very important aspect of improving the air we breathe. And another thing is um, having better public transportation would also help because if more people would be able to use, for example, MARTA to get to work or elsewhere, then we would also have fewer cars on the roads and lower air pollution concentrations. So improving um, public transportation plus having more and more affordable EVs on our roads um, would definitely help to improve the air we breathe in Atlanta. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hewells. This has been very, very informative, most enlightening. And I think that you've given a lot of people a good reason to wear an N95 mask that has nothing to do with politics. It's all about protecting ourselves from pollution. And yes, to the listener or uh, viewer who talked about N95 masks being somewhat difficult when it's hot outside and hard to breathe, I would say to you that some kind of face covering would be better than none. But as we learned during COVID, you really should be wearing your masks when you are in an environment that's likely to be crowded, that's likely to be polluted. So use your judgment accordingly, you know. Um, I think the problem that's occurred in our, our, our culture and our society that sometimes is Americans, we it like things to be comfortable. And sometimes the things that are good for us aren't always the most comfortable for us. Like many of us don't like to exercise and I'm one of them, but exercise is better for us. And that's something that's a a known lack of exercise is a known risk factor for dementia, heart disease, and a lot of other things. So I think that we have to start looking with looking at other ways to within our own little comfort zones that make us comfortable, but do what we can to try to eliminate some of the problems that make it more likely for us to have poor health outcomes. And, you know, living next to a factory, living next to the airport probably isn't the best solution, but there are things when we're living within those environments that help us. So exercise, taking care of ourselves, eating healthfully are some of the things that add to the resilience and make it less likely that those things are gonna make, have bad effects, give us, have bad effects on our health overall. So thank you so much, Dr. Hules. We'll be getting back to you. Do you have any studies that you want us to know about that have to do with the environment? Um, shall I send you the link? to an yes. article or what would be yes. best. Yeah, I can I can send you the link to one of our recent studies. 
um, we would, I, I think we have a crew of people who are very much interested in participating and learning more about them. And we look forward to hearing from you later on in the fall where you can talk more about these studies uh, when we have our Carter Center Forum.